Hey there, I'm Pastor Darrell. Welcome to Mount Moriah. So uh, here we are back from uh, vacation again. Uh, I don't know if I've ever taken so many vacations so close together, uh, but eventually it kind of takes it wears on you a little bit. You, you're wondering if if you're more relaxed or you're, or you're more stressed out. Um, but it was so awesome last week, and I say this every week that I come back. So awesome last week to be someplace else, but yet still be here. Um, and I'm so thankful for the ministry that we have on Facebook and the ministry that we have um, on. Uh, what's the other one? YouTube. Uh, I'm so thankful for those because uh, it gave us an opportunity this past week. We had a couple people with us uh, that I sat them down in front of a tablet and, and brought them to church. Um, and so they got to worship with you and got to hear the gospel and the truth. And, and you realize when you're sitting next to someone like that, you realize that this is reaching people that we, we don't even know about. You have no idea who that person is. That person's never stepped foot in this church, uh, but we got to be an instrument, a tool that was used by God uh, for someone who needed it. And the message that Steve brought last week was so perfect. Uh, And that just shows that God has orchestrated all of this. Um, And he knows what he's doing, uh, like we ever had any doubts, right? Um, So here we go, Matthew chapter 8, 1 through 4. I want to get through this uh, this morning because uh, it seems like it's four short verses, but there is so much, um, so much emotion, uh, so much things, so many things that we can pull out of this passage uh, that we can identify with, and I think that's part of what is the the hardest uh, part of giving a, a message from a passage like this is when you begin to see yourself as as one of the characters, one of the the, the people in the story or in the event, uh, you begin to realize how you can relate to that person. Uh, and just like last week with the thieves on the cross, understanding uh, the, the just enormity and the awe of who God is uh, and how the stories, even though they're slightly different, are pretty much all the same. Uh, This is what Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4 says. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof of them. Now when we look at this passage, it looks like just a a miracle uh, that Christ has performed. Uh, It's actually one of three that that they kind of categorize as uh, misfits or or people that that really wouldn't naturally or normally be around Jesus. Um, We see that this is the healing of a leper who is socially an outcast because of of a disease uh, that they have. We see that the next uh, story following that is the centurion who has a slave or has uh, one of his soldiers needs to be healed. So he comes to Jesus. He's a pagan. Uh, So there's two unlikely people that would come to Jesus. And then uh, the Bible is the great liberator of women. Uh, I know we we tend to to frown upon that or say that that the, the Bible doesn't lift women up or exalt women. But we see Jesus takes the time even after that to heal Peter's mother in law. And so we see three unlikely uh, events that that are taking place here, and we're going to see how we can identify, especially this morning with the first one. But when we skip to the end of of these events, when we see in verse 17, we see that this is why they happen, and we need to understand this and be clear about this. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illness, and he bore our diseases. And that's in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. So I want us to keep in mind that these miracles, and especially this miracle this morning, has a purpose. And it was to fulfill uh, a prophecy that only the Messiah, the true Messiah, could fulfill. 
And in so doing, Jesus identifies himself as to exactly who he is. But there's about seven or eight things in here that I want us to see, and we'll go over them quickly, uh, as quickly as possible. But when we get to this picture, we see that Jesus came down from the mountain. There's two different ideas. There was the idea that he was teaching on the mountain, so he was coming off of a, a spiritual high, that, that he would have been ministering to people, probably a little bit of exhaustion, probably a little bit of, uh, of that feeling that, that we all get when we, we've just done our job, we've done it well, we've done it to, to the fullest extent. Or we see that there's oftentimes that Jesus went up to the mountain to pray and, and to be with his Father and to just take that time to, to be revived spiritually uh, in, in knowing that, that he is uh, one with his Father and he's in communion with his Father. So he comes off this mountain, all of these people are following him, and then a person, an unlikely person, arrives on the scene. We see that a man with leprosy, and leprosy is really a a description of a lot of different uh, skin diseases in the Bible, but leprosy in the condition that we believe this man was, uh, in its most benign form, could have just been a single uh, or a simple fungal bacterial uh, surface disease or, or, you know, like acne or, or anything that was just uh, out of the ordinary. Um, and it's absolute worse, which is what we believe this man was probably suffering from. It's a skin-eating disease that would leave people, uh, they would leave, um, would leave people um, with separated joints, uh, horrifically disfigured, uh, and actually debilitated, and it would actually contort people. They said people who, who would suffer from this form uh, of leprosy would actually, uh, they wouldn't be able to walk, they would be bent over, they would be just contorted into these uh, horrible forms. And so this man is suffering from what we would call a hopeless disease. This hopeless disease is actually described in Leviticus 13. The entire chapter pretty much is taken up describing the diagnosis and the social repercussions of these diseases. So leprosy, in some cases, the priest would, they would go to the priest and the priest would deem them uh, to be good to go. Nothing major, you, just a little skin infection. You can, you can go back to your family. You can enjoy life the, the way you always have with no worries. In other cases, a little bit worse, the, the uh, priest would say, you know what, there, there is, does seem to be a problem here. Um, because of this, we're going to deem you to be unclean. Uh, and that was the, the word that they would use. They were unclean, so they would isolate that person for seven days to 14 days. At the end of that, they would reevaluate, and if they'd recovered, there was a simple purification ceremony, and when they were finished with that ceremony, they could go back and they could be with their families. But yet in the most severe cases, and more of the severe cases, when you were considered unclean, uh, you would come back and they would continually uh, certify you as being unclean. You would be completely ostracized from your family and from your community. Leprosy would completely separate you from everyone else except for some of the same people that had the same disease. So to be encouraged, you got to go around and be with other sick people. You got to hang out with other sick people, and they would build these communities together. And at that time, nowadays, there there are treatments. Nowadays, there are even some cures for some of these forms uh, of what they would determine to be leprosy back in those days. But in those days, there was no known medical treatment. You just pretty much had to suffer through it. Um, and, And by the time that you would suffer through it, ultimately, it would lead to a deteriorating death. It was a hopeless disease. I mean, that's the only way that you can really define it. The second thing that we see in this passage, though, is a hopeful recognition. As we see this leper, he is coming to Jesus, and we see it kind of being uh, this, he's out of place. He's not where he's supposed to be. To say he was part of the crowd would be absolutely unlikely, but from a distance, maybe from the advice of maybe a family member or a friend, somebody had mentioned to this man, you should go see Jesus. Either he had heard of it, either some friend or family had, had told him about Jesus, or, or maybe he had just overheard in a crowd, or, or whatever it might be, there was this recognition of who Jesus was. 
People weren't simply astonished by Jesus' teaching. If we look back into Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, we were already experiencing not just the teaching, but we were seeing more and more people aware of his power. In Matthew 4, 23, it said that in Galilee, he was teaching, he was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and he was healing every disease and every affliction among people. And we'll come back to that because I think that that is part of what we miss when we see this leper coming to Jesus. One of the hopeful recognitions that we see is we see that immediately the leper calls out, Lord. Now the word in this passage is kurios. And in the Hebrew, it's actually equivalent to Adonai. Now Adonai and kurios both mean that this person recognized Jesus as a supreme authority. It doesn't necessarily mean master, so to speak, in the the idea of slavery. It doesn't mean master in in, uh, the rank of military. But what this is talking about is when he mentions this word, when he cries out, Lord, he is actually understanding, he's actually recognizing Jesus' deity and his authority, supreme authority. So when we see that hopeful recognition, just the simple statement of him calling out Lord shows us that this man had an idea of who Jesus was. He had an idea that Jesus was not only this man who was teaching, not only this man who was healing, but this was God who had created the world. This was God who had sustained the world. This was God who was keeping his people, keeping his word, and his promises in his hand. So when he calls him Lord, we see that there is the recognition of who Jesus is. A lot of people just followed him simply for his, uh, for his teaching. A lot of them followed him just simply for his healing. But this man actually kneels down and worships Jesus. So there in following is the helpless plea. When we look a little bit further into the passage, we see, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. There is a certainty of a sense of desperate need in this man's prayer or in this man's conversation or in this man's plea. We see that there is a deep sense of humility that is involved in it, and we observe that there is worship happening. Simply being there was already a bold move. There's no way in the world this man should have been around a crowd, much less approaching one individual. You see, leprosy was an extremely contagious disease, so as he would approach someone, he was supposed to call out, unclean, unclean, so the people would avoid him, and they would walk on different sides of the street than one another. So approaching Jesus was already a risk. He could be hurt. He could, be, he could be excommunicated even beyond what he had been. He could be killed. He could be just simply put away. But he comes to Jesus with this plea of, if you will. If you will is the focus of what uh, I believe this passage is. Because when we look at that, the first thing that we want to say is, if you will, he's not sure that there might be a lack of faith, that there might be an idea that, that Jesus can't or, or, or won't. It's not a lack of faith, but I think it's more of a sense of what we were talking about in the song that we sang this morning, a sense of being unworthy, a sense of, I don't deserve it. I know that Jesus can, but I, I just don't think that he will because of what I've done, because of who I am, because of, of, of what I've uh, been through, my situation or my circumstances. So what this, uh, if you will, is actually asking Jesus, and I like the message in this passage, if you want to. Can you imagine walking up to someone that has all the power in the world, understanding that they could do anything that they want, and going up to them and just simply saying, if you want to. I know you don't have to, but if you want to. So here's what I see and and what I think is deeply happening about this one question or, or this one declaration. This man has heard of or he's seen what we mentioned in Matthew 4.23. 
He has seen and heard that Jesus was healing every disease and every affliction among the people. But for some reason, for some reason, he thought his was excluded. He thought his didn't count. For some reason, he thought specifically that his wasn't worthy. So why might you imagine that this man thinks Jesus might not want to heal him? And that question went over and over and over in my mind. If you see that Jesus is healing everyone, if you see that Jesus is taking everyone's disease and making it well, what might make you imagine that Jesus doesn't want to heal you? And the only possibility that I could think of is that if he himself, or even more sadly, someone else has convinced him that his disease or he himself may be or is beyond hope. He's out of reach of Jesus because he can't even approach people. He's out of Jesus' desire because Jesus doesn't know who he is or what he's done or how he's contracted this leprosy. And a lot of people believe that leprosy was a judgment of sin. Now, it's an illustration of sin, but not necessarily a judgment of sin. But this man may have been convinced that you've done something so horrible that you've contracted this disease and you are outside of Jesus' desire to heal. And ultimately, this man was convinced that Jesus wouldn't love him. Jesus couldn't love him because of what he looked like, because of how he felt, because of how he was ostracized by the priests, by the people of his community. He thought he was outside of the reach of Jesus, outside of Jesus' desire, and ultimately outside of the reach of Jesus' love. But even in this condition, he expressed a true faith. You see, it's as simple as this. And this part is as clear as it can possibly be. Even in his questioning, he was confident and certain, you can make me clean. There was no doubt in his mind. He'd seen it a thousand times before. He'd heard about it uh, probably from the time that he'd seen Jesus arrive on the scene. He had no doubt about Jesus' authority. He had no doubt about Jesus' power, but he had so much doubt about his own worth and maybe even God's love for him. But he was convinced without a shadow of a doubt that you can make me clean. So the fifth thing that we see in this passage is an amazing reply. And the amazing reply I want us to pay close attention to because he could have done it from six feet away. And I know we used to say 10 feet away, but I think uh, because of what we've experienced, six feet is plenty, right? Jesus could have done this from six feet away. But what it scripture teaches or shows is that he first stretched out his hand, and then he touched the man. That was unheard of. Because this disease was so contagious. And I've seen, uh, I haven't seen the actual show yet, but but the chosen that it has been, uh, that everybody's been watching, it's in season two. Um, I've seen the highlights, or whatever you might call it, when Jesus is about to to perform this miracle. uh, And everybody's like, Jesus, don't touch him. Whatever you do, just don't touch this guy. You know, he's already close enough. Just, and, and they begin to freak out. And when Jesus reaches out and touches him, uh, it is just an amazing picture to me of who Jesus is. Jesus is above and beyond all disease. But what Jesus shows in that situation is that he loved him and that he had compassion upon him. You see, he said that he he reached out and touched him. This man has probably not been touched since he'd been diagnosed, maybe even before, because the quarantine had separated him from absolutely everyone he loved, absolutely everyone that he was fond of, everyone that he believed loved him. So there had been no touch. There had been no hugs. There have been no handshakes. There have been nothing. But Jesus reaches out 
and he touches the man for the first time. I had a dog, and that dog's name was Brady, and Brady, we believe, was neglected uh, the first two years of his life. Maybe not the whole entire two years, but uh, the person who owned him uh, had gotten to the point where he couldn't show any affection uh, to the dog. He, he could feed him, and, and that was about it. And, and, and you know, that, that's no big deal, but we were given the opportunity. They asked if we wanted to take care of him, and, and so when we brought Brady home, uh, I swear without a, a shadow of a doubt that as this dog, he wanted to be touched and loved so much that you could have beaten that dog. I'm completely against animal cruelty. You could have beaten that dog to death, and the last thing on that dog's mind would have been, somebody's touching me. Somebody is just reaching out and touching me. And I suppose that this man would have had that type of desire for interaction. I mean, shoot, for a year and a half. I mean, some of us were dying without the handshakes. I've got a couple of friends. They don't want hugs. They don't want handshakes or anything. But for some of us, that's a big deal. For this man, that's a big deal. But the amazing reply is in this. All of that going on, reaching out, touching him, but to hear the words, I will. And that I want us to translate that a little bit. I want us to go a little bit. It's not, I intend to. It's not, I'm going to, but what it really means is I am choosing to. I want to. And I want us to, to think even beyond that. What might this man have heard in the inflection of Jesus' voice? What he might have seen in the body language and the facial expression of God himself when he's speaking this word. I choose to. I am disposed to. I intend to. But close your eyes and imagine what it felt like to have Jesus lovingly look down at this man and say, I want to, I desire to, I would love to. Nothing would give me greater pleasure. That's what those three, sorry, those two little words meant. It would be Jesus' greatest pleasure. I mean, that's the best I've gotten through that portion of this passage, of this scripture. Um, because that is just so emotional to me. It's just so much of a demonstration of who Christ was and the compassion that he had. Nothing would give me greater pleasure. You are clean. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. I like the word immediately because it doesn't mean that it took the seven or the 14 days so that anybody could doubt. I like it that it was immediately because it showed that this man not only could immediately be healed, but he could immediately go back to his family. He could immediately go back to the people he loved. There was no waiting. There's no 10 days. There's no 14 days. There's no 7 days. There, there's no more of this being ostracized. I mean, immediately this man was brought back to be completely whole, not just physically, but emotionally, not just emotionally, but socially. He was made completely whole in the immediate, a moment. Jesus had the ability to heal, and he wanted to, and he did. And then we see a seemingly odd request. When we look at this passage, we see Jesus saying, don't say anything to anyone. You see, his popularity was making it harder and harder for him to be able to minister in different places. He tells him, don't, show, don't say anything to anyone, but go immediately and show yourselves to the priest. The reason he did this, go back again to Leviticus 14. There was a whole bunch of ritual. There was a whole bunch of ceremony. There was this whole thing that he had to do to, to have the priest declare him clean. And he was to offer a sacrifice, a, a thanksgiving offering uh, to Christ. To, to God so that people would, would understand. And, and Moses was the one that had given them this direction. And what it was to be was to be the proof for them. So who was them? It was the actual priests themselves. So when we see this request, don't say anything to anyone. Go show yourselves to the priest. Offer the gift that Moses has required, and then let it be proof for them or let it be a testimony for them to see. There's a reason why he was asked to go to the priest first. It's so that he could be declared clean. Because other people may not have believed that he was ever sick. 
They may not have ever believed that he was, was a leper at one time or another, but it was to be a proof. So the interesting response, and for this interesting response, you have to go back to Mark chapter 1, verse 45. There's an interesting response and an interesting result. In Mark chapter 1, verse 45, it tells us that this man, instead of going straight to the priest, he goes out into the community, he goes out into the crowd, and he begins to tell everyone about how Jesus had healed him. And I want us to understand, you think, well, that would be the right thing to do. That would be the, the place to be. That would be uh, the thing that would, would, be the most, would bring the most glory, the most honor to God. But actually, it, it, it caused a problem. It says in Mark chapter 1, verse 45, But he went out and he began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. When we look at this, we see that we would think, this is awesome. The guy's so excited about being, being saved, being rescued. He went out and he told everyone. But in the process, he was being disobedient to Christ. He was being disobedient to what the purpose would be. So the result was the priests that were to see or to understand this testimony that was meant for them, they were never able to witness it. They were never able to see what Christ had done. Jesus was no longer able to enter into the towns and so he had to resort to the more secluded places. And so if we look at this response of praise or this response of ultimately disobedience, it's possible that some people may have never gotten to see or meet Jesus as a result of a man's disobedience. Well, but he was giving honor. He was praising Jesus, right? He was doing what we would deem to be okay. But the act of obedience here was more important because it would have allowed more people to understand, more people to see. And especially when I consider the priests, just think if those priests had seen this early or had been changed this early in Jesus' ministry, how things may have been different. I'm not being overly critical because I think I probably would have done the same thing. It would have been that excitement of being able to go back and do the things that I wasn't able to do and would have completely thought and would have completely been in the idea of I'm giving Jesus and God all the praise that he deserves. But I would have been ultimately just as disobedient as this man. So I want us to look at how this relates, and these are the important parts, I I think, for us to, to make it more for us. When we look at this passage, the number one that we had before, the hopeless disease, for us, it's not leprosy. For us, Scripture teaches that sin is the hopeless disease that we all suffer from. You see, leprosy has been used in an illustration of sin all the way back into the Old Testament. Wearsby is the one who put this small little paragraph together, but what Leviticus 13 will help us to see in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 5 through 6, what it will show us, if you go back and look, is that we need to understand the nature of sin in and of itself. Just as leprosy was deeper than a surface-level skin disease, sin is deeper than our skin. It spreads just like everything else. It's contagious. It defiles and isolates. Ultimately, we believe that sin draws us together so that we can have more fun, we can party together, we can do all the things that we enjoy doing, and and you know, it's no fun to sin alone. So what it does is it begins to make us feel like we're becoming part of a group. We fit in. But ultimately what it's doing is separating us from our loved ones. It's separating us from, from our communities. And it's separating us ultimately from God himself. So when we see that, we we understand that as it's defiling and as it's isolating us, Scripture in Leviticus chapter 13, verses 52 and 57, says that it's only fit for the fire. It's only fit for destruction. That's what sin does, the hopeless disease that exists, the hopeless disease that has been shown. When we look at how that relates to us, the Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So each and every one of us suffer or have suffered from this disease. 
We can't avoid it. It's that contagious. It just passes down from generation to generation. And what we ultimately see in Romans 6.23 is that the wages of this sin or the response or the result of this sin is ultimately death. And that death is separation from God for eternity. Now, some of us have heard that through the Romans road and, and things like that. But ultimately, we don't see our sin as a disease. We see our sin as just something that we do. This is something that's seriously destroying us from the inside out. The second thing that we see in, in identifying with this character is we've been given the opportunity and the ability to recognize Jesus just like the leper was. Somewhere, some way in our lives, we have been told about Jesus, if not before now, this morning. And we've been given an opportunity to respond to who Jesus is, to understand who he is and what he's capable of doing. And if you're not satisfied with the invitation that you've received from us, then receive the invitation from Christ himself. Because he says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus himself is inviting you to come. The leper thought that he had to sneak up to find Jesus, when ultimately Jesus was looking for this man all along and inviting him to come. The third thing that we do to relate to this passage is we should come to him in a sense of desperate need and deep humility. We are absolutely right to understand that we don't deserve healing. We don't deserve salvation. But it's God's grace, and it's all about giving us a love and a forgiveness that we don't deserve. Everything that we sang in that first song this morning describes to the opportunity and the possibility that we have, even though we don't deserve it, God's amazing grace makes it possible for us to be healed and to be saved from absolutely everything that sin has destroyed. Sometimes we want to think of Jesus as just being the person who's going to physically heal us. But it's most, most important and it's much more important to understand, understand this desperate need that we have for salvation. A healing of our soul rather than a healing of our body. Because our bodies are going to deteriorate, they're going to die, they're going to pass away. But our soul is going to last forever. So the deepest, de most desperate need we have is for forgiveness of our sins. And the Bible described it in Romans 6.23, although the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is the eternal life that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The fourth thing that we relate to in this passage is that we believe that he is the Son of God, sent to die in our place for our sin, buried and raised again, and he alone can forgive you of your sin and save you from your sin. So we confess just as the leper did. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, we confess just as he did with our mouth that Jesus is our Lord. He's our Koryos. He's our Adonai. He is the supreme authority. He is the one and the only who can save us from our sins. And we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. And if we do those things, then we will be saved. Or, or the ultimate idea is our spirit is healed. And the fifth thing that we understand is that understanding this, that no matter what you've done, who you are or who you once were, None of that changes the desire that he has for you. This man, a leper, says, if you will, you can make me clean. Jesus says, I will be clean. I'm a murderer. If you look in Matthew 15 and Galatians chapter 5, you, you'll see a list of all these different sins, all these different situations that, that people are overwhelmed or overcome by. I'm a murderer, or I've hated my brother. If you will, you can make me clean. I'm a slanderer. If you will, you can make me clean. I'm greedy. If you will, you can make me clean. I'm a liar. If you will, you can make me clean. I'm an adulterer. If you will, you can make me clean. I'm sexually immoral. If you will, you can make me clean. I'm a thief. If you will, you can make me clean. I'm addicted to alcohol, drugs, or pornography. But if you will, you can make me clean. I'm a sinner. 
but if you will, you can make me clean. That pretty much, pretty much sums up all of our heart's deepest desire is for someone to love us, someone to help us, someone to make us clean. And Jesus replies, stretching out his hands, I love you, and I want to be clean. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. Some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. What that verse is saying is the Lord, our Kurios, our Adonai, the Lord wants to fulfill his promise of, repent, of, of forgiveness and salvation. And he's waiting for us to come to him in repentance, to turn from our sins and put our faith and trust in him. That's what God's desire is. And when we come to him, he cleans us. What does Jesus ask us to do? To ask us to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And that's in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. The funny thing, I think, and a lot of commentators made comment about this, it's funny how he asked the man to keep quiet, and he couldn't. He just couldn't do it. There was just so much going on in that man's life. There was so much healing. There was so much rejoicing. He couldn't keep it in. But Jesus asks us to show and to tell the world. And it's not that we can't. It's that we choose that we won't. Think of all of the people. Think of all the effects that our disobedience to his commands has. How many people... How many people Jesus has asked you to show proof to? Has he asked you to go to the priests? Has he asked you to go to your friends? Has he asked you to go to your family? Your disobedience could keep someone from hearing about and seeing the evidence of what Christ can do. The forgiveness that he's offered to us. The forgiveness that he's offered to the world because he loves them and he wants to save them just like he wants to save you. If you need to experience the salvation that only comes through repentance and belief in Christ, all you have to do is recognize who he is and ask if he will and then let him make you clean. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given an opportunity for us to be flawless, that you've given us an opportunity to be clean, that, God, you're waiting for us, that while we were sinners, you sent Jesus to die for us. God, you want us. You love us. Sometimes we think we're separated because of situation or circumstance or maybe the sin in our lives and we think that that's more powerful or has more authority or or makes us more worthless and God ultimately what that makes us is just like everybody else a person who's in need of a savior a person who needs to be made clean a person who needs to be made whole God bring us to a place of faith in you bring us to a place where we will get down on our knees and simply confess to you that if you will, you can make us clean and allow us to hear your words. I will be clean.